Thank you very much. My name is Laura Livingston. I am a judge in Austin, Texas, and um, hear general civil cases, including family law. And my co-presenter today is Leslie Orloff from the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, and also Amy Cuccinella from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So uh, if everyone can hear me, we're going to advance the slides and uh, just let us know if you have a question, and we'll uh, try to take questions in the chat box. So we'd like to ask just a few questions about where everybody is located. So in the text box there, if you would, just let us know where city and state you're in. It's always helpful for us to know where uh, people are located and uh, where things are happening out in the field. So if you'll just take a minute to tell us what city and state you're in in the text box, please. So it looks like we've got people from Michigan, Pennsylvania, other people on the line. I can see there's about 90 of you or 100 of you. So just try the chat box. Chat box. It's up on the right. Um, also, this will be an opportunity. You can ask questions during the webinar and type them in the same location, and we'll be able to see them. So in addition to um, uh, Amy and Danielle, do you want to introduce yourselves as well? Certainly. My name is Danielle Scott I'm with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security with the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And I'm a senior policy advisor here. Amy and Danielle are pictured by the flag there. As I get older, a lot better looking picture than mine. So thank you both for joining us as well. So on this next slide, we're just going to ask you uh, kind of to check a box here. And how would you describe your position? Uh, judicial officer is choice A, court staff choice B, attorneys out in the field choice C, and other. So let's And in other, um, you can uh, type in the chat box as well. so that we can know what that means. We've got a couple people typing. OK. So far, it looks like everybody is other. <laughs> okay. uh, here we go. Cor program coordinator for victim services program. Great. Welcome. Anybody else? We still have a couple of other people. Domestic violence shelter supervisor. Great, welcome. Okay. Good. So, All right. OK, well, in terms of the learning objectives, by the end of this webinar, we are hoping that you'll be, uh, for the judges and judicial officers, certainly able to rule on discovery matters in family and civil and, and also criminal court cases, because we're going to talk a lot about uh, how those things are implicated in this space. Um, we're hoping that you'll leave here with the ability to better able identify litigants who are crime victims, understand more about what protections they are afforded under VAVA confidentiality protections, um, and then use accurate information with a better understanding about federal VAVA confidentiality regulations and policies so that you can better address the issues that arise both out in the field as well as at courthouses and in the context of a particular family or criminal court case. That's our goal, and we uh, hope to be successful. And with your help in answering, asking us questions, uh, we hope to make it interactive so that we can make sure we meet your needs and your expectations. Great. And I just posted, as we get going, I just posted the materials link for this webinar in the chat box. So um, just to get started, we wanted to give you a little bit of background on, we're going to be talking about VAWA confidentiality. Um, and this, is, uh, this was developed and in, originally implemented in 1996 and has been improved in every iteration of the Violence Against Women Act to date. Um, these provisions are designed to um, to protect victims against deportation and to protect uh, against um, the government, the Department of Homeland Security officials 
from being essentially tricked into relying upon perpetrator-provided information to harm victims. Um, and that the Violence Against Women Act immigration relief, um, the forms of relief that are available to immigrant victims um, include many different kinds of relief. There's the VAWA self-petition, the U visa, the T visa, um, continued presence. Um, there is work authorization for visa holders and other forms of relief that have been designed over the years by Congress to offer legal uh, immigration, access to legal immigration status for immigrant victims of crime and for um, immigrant children. Laura? And as you can see by just looking at this chart that's up now, I mean, look at all the different colors and the different sort of avenues for protection. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of protection available. What I think one of our challenges is to make sure that folks in the field and, and individual clients who need assistance understand the protections and that advocates, judges um, understand how to make sure that people know what protections are available to them and help them access them. Uh, and, and that remains a challenge. So uh, in, in state court proceedings, VAVA confidentiality is, is extremely important. And as you can see, all the different sort of pathways that are illustrated by, um, by this chart. In the courthouse, we need to know about these things as judges and judicial officers because we're entering court orders that need to have some teeth to them, but they also need to make sense in terms of producing best outcomes for families and especially uh, better outcomes for children. Um, so if I'm going to enter into, let's say I have a CPS case or even just a regular family law divorce case where uh, I'm dealing with a family with immigration issues that they're facing. How do I make orders that are going to protect the kids? How, do I going to, how am I going to make orders that make sure that uh, child support and health insurance and other benefits are being accessed? The more information I have as a judicial officer, the better I'm able to create a valid and sensible court order, and the more easy it's going to be, the easier it's going to be for someone to be able to comply with a court order that I've entered. The one thing I don't want to do when I'm entering a court order is set people up for failure. So I don't want to start ordering things for the sake of ordering something that really has no relationship to something that someone can actually obtain um, or benefit from or be helpful to them. And so I need to be able to know what's out there what's available, what's helpful, what's useful, whether or not someone can access it. And the more information I have about that, the better my court order is going to be, and the, frankly, the better the compliance with that court order is going to be. Ultimately, what I want to do is promote access to justice, but I want that not only once they get here and they've got access, I want the outcome to be a fair and just one. And I want it to make sense for families. I want it to make sense for children. I also want to protect folks, frankly, from manipulation of the system. I don't want perpetrators to be able to use the state court system to get information, by way of example, that it might otherwise be protected by federal or state law. And, and we have seen some amazing um, attempts on the part of perpetrators to get information that they want to use in an evil way uh, when they are, shouldn't be able to get that information. So we have to be able to protect the confidential information that is protected under the federal law in particular. Um, the other issue, and this one has been really sort of one that's come up very recently, and that is that you know, there are places that are prohibited from immigration enforcement, and we have seen some examples of that not being respected uh, lately. I'm in Texas, and we've had some recent issues about that, and so the more the advocates and the more the judges and uh, people who maintain uh, business at the courthouses understand these protections and, and what's available and what's not and what's appropriate and what's not, the better we'll be able to protect the people in, in our communities and keep them safe. So we're going to talk more about that this afternoon as well. Let's go to the next slide. So what's, so, and what's great about this is we have Amy Cuccinella and Danielle Scott with us from the Department of Homeland Security who are going to help us better understand the VAWA confidentiality protections and how they work to accomplish the things Judge Livingston was just talking about. Over to you, Amy. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so I'm going to start by going over the three um, 
prohibitions to vow a confidentiality. And I will go into all of these a little more in depth later. The first um, prohibition bars DHS, DOJ, and State Department from taking enforcement action against a victim based solely upon information provided by the, the abuser, the crime perpetrator, or their family members. The second is a location prohibition, um, which the judge was just talking about. It prohibits enforcement action at certain locations, including a courthouse, unless DHS has complied with specific statutory and policy safeguards. And the last prohibition prevents DHS, DOJ, and DOS from disclosing VAWA information to anyone unless one of the enumerated exceptions apply. And I'll also go into those a little bit later. Um, and as you can see, these prohibitions protect applicants of several benefits, including VAWA self-petitioners, VAWA cancellation suspension, TEU visa, battered spouse waiver, and abuse visa um, holders. So these non-disclosure provisions, to give you a little bit more information about which victims um, they protect, Non-disclosure essentially protects anybody that has a VAWA confidentiality protected case, which was the list Amy just told you about. So many forms of immigration relief, particularly VAWA, T, and U visas, are covered by that. The abuser provided information prohibition applies any time there's spouse abuse or child abuse involved without regard to whether anybody has ever filed anything or is in the process of filing anything. It applies to all other forms of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and a variety of other criminal activities once the victim is in the process of filing a U or T visa. And it applies to abused spouses of work visa holders um, at the point at which they filed for work authorization. The locational prohibitions protect all victims and there's either supposed to be no action at a protected location, or as Amy will describe in a lot more detail in a few minutes, um, they have to have gone through fairly strict uh, 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 steps at the Department of Homeland Security to essentially work their way up a chain of command before they go uh, try to do any kind of enforcement action after uh, against a victim at any of these locations. So, um, Amy, is this mine or yours? <laughs> uh, this is yours. Okay. Um, so the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, one of the reasons that the chart that Laura was, Judge Livingston was talking about earlier is so important is that's a tool that's a one-pager that courthouses can make available um, together with a DHS brochure that we also have in the materials for you. And the reason that's so important is that once survivors and victims who file for immigration relief, their cases get essentially screened and logged in to a computer system at the Department of Homeland Security that flags those cases so that, in, so that people who work at the Department of Homeland Security in all aspects of their work there can identify whether the case involves a crime victim. And this helps notify immigration enforcement officers that someone who they got a tip on is actually a crime victim. So the sooner that somebody learns about the relief and files an immigration case, the more effective the VAWA confidentiality provisions will work for that victim. Um, and the cases that are in the red flag in this, in this system um, are the ones listed here. It's a VAWA self-petition, cancellation, suspension, U visas, T visas, um, and a, a work, uh, abuse spouses of work, work visa holders. Leslie, can, can you or Amy or Daniela talk a little bit about how that works practically? I mean, it, does it work, I guess? That's, that's really the question I have. I, I know that there's supposed to be a red flag, but does it work in practice? Um, it's an imperfect system. It is, the flag is only in one of our several immigration databases right now. It's called the Central Index System. Um, it is a pretty routine part of what USCIS may check when processing a case. It's not always something that might be on the radar of ICE and CBP, but we're working 
both to have them check it um, more frequently, including some DHS-wide policy um, highlights that they should be checking this database. And we're also, I think, working on the technology and to try to push that flag into our other databases. But that's a long-term goal. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And, and so what that means, I think, for advocates and attorneys is that with good advocacy, though, we can make the system work. But sometimes, um, Judge, it will take more advocacy than just assuming that the computer system will take care of it. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm assuming that advocates out in the, in the community, especially lawyers that discover that you know, the, the flag system didn't work as well as it should have, can alert the folks at DHS and that they would be receptive to you know, improving the system. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons um, we have Amy and Danielle here, and also new app. Uh, we provide uh, te direct technical assistance on those issues. So we we get any time we encourage people to call us. I'll put the numbers in the chat box in a moment. Um, any time there's been uh, what might look might, might be a VAWA confidentiality violation, and we'll walk you through the process and assist you in potentially um, in trying to help remedy the problem immediately and then potentially exploring whether it makes, you know, whether it might be appropriate to file a complaint, which they'll be talking about in a few minutes. Great. Thanks. Okay. So one of the questions we get asked a lot is when does um, VAWA confidentiality end? And it is going to run until the case is denied on the merits or all, and all options uh, to appeal have been exhausted. We're now going to look a little more closely at the first um, of the three prohibitions I mentioned earlier pertaining to acting on tips from a perpetrator. Um, so VAWA confidentiality alleged history um, says that federal officials may not use information furnished by or de derived from information provided solely by an abuser, crime perpetrator, or trafficker to make an adverse determination of admissibility or removal of an alien. To get more into the specifics now, the government cannot rely on information to take an adverse action against a victim based only on information provided by um, a domestic violence or child abuser, sexual assault or stalking perpetrator, a trafficker, a perpetrator of any of the U visa list crimes, which is a pretty long list, the perpetrator's family member, or a person associated with the perpetrator. And, um, the victims are not necessarily required to have filed um, an immigration application to be protected. All spouses and child abuse victims, so think VAWA cases, are protected without a filing being required. Um, and victims in the process of filing T or U visa cases um, are protected. And adverse action, what we mean by that is um, using perpetrator provided information to deny a victim immigration case, to detain a victim, deport a victim, initiate an enforcement action, or to even seek out, question, or detain the victim at a prohibited location. So in 2003, DHS finalized our department-wide instruction, which is really just a fancy word for a policy, um, on VAWA confidentiality, although if you look this up, we call it Section 1367 confidentiality, not VAWA confidentiality within the, the department. And this policy notes that adverse information about a victim from a prohibited source should be treated as inherently suspect. Um, it also says, quote, whenever a DHS officer or employee receives adverse information from a spouse, family member of a spouse, or unknown private individual, the employee will check the central index system, that's the database I was talking about earlier, for a code of admission, COA, 384 flag. Employees will be sensitive to the fact that the alien at issue may be a victim and that a victim abuser dynamic may be at play. So um, maybe how okay. do these locational provisions sort of play out? What, what does this mean at these locations that where it's enforcement is prohibited? Uh, well, I think I'm going to get into that a little bit more later. Um, okay. And actually on this slide. Um, enforcement actions are not to be taken at the following locations unless DHS has certified in advance that it has complied with VAWA confidentiality requirements. 
And these locations that are protected are shelter, rape crisis center, supervised visitation center, family justice center, victim services program or provider, community-based organization, and perhaps most importantly to you guys, courthouse. In connection with any protection order, child custody case, civil or criminal case involving or related to domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, or stalking. So now one thing that I, I do see some confusion with sometimes is that the courthouse prohibition is not a prohibition against um, any type of case. It is only these cases that you can sort of think of as having a link to the, um, to the victim um, circumstances. Can you talk a little bit more, though, about what the, the first bullet point where it says that actions are not to be taken unless the action is certified in advance through a specific process aimed at yes. protecting citizens? Can you talk about logistically sort of how that gets worked out? I can. That's actually a slide um, just a little bit further down uh, where it's bulleted out. So if how excited can... I am? <laughs> you are excited. <laughs> Um, and did you want to add anything, Laura, to the locational prohibitions? Well, I think I'm going to wait because until you get to the, the later slide, because I, I have a story to tell about a recent experience that we had at our courthouse and, um, and how logistically a nightmare it turned out to be in this particular instance and how what a lack of information about these things meant for, for victims and for families and folks in the courthouse and the fear that it caused. So I think I'll wait to give my to tell my one minute war story a little bit later. But I would ask okay. people to think about just how important this is, uh, because it really can have devastating, unintended consequences if it's not handled properly. And so when we get into the details of, of the logistics of it, I'll I'll tell you my war story. Leslie. Okay. So um, as VAWA confidentiality um, in terms of any violations, if there have been, if you've been, if you're in a jurisdiction where violations have occurred, could you click the boxes and let us know where you're seeing um, or problems, if, if any, that have had, happened in your courthouses? So the choices are protection order, child custody, eviction, or no, so actually no, I'm saying this wrong. So the, the, the question is, if they, if there's VAWA confidential, if an official comes to the courthouse in response to a tip from the perpetrator, in which of the following proceedings um, can they, I'm reading my thing here. When is there a violation? Is there a violation, right. exactly. We have one vote, it says all of the above. Two for all of the above. Anybody else? Sorry, I just are, wanted, are people I just able to, to pop in? Yes, it looks like in just a few minutes our webinar room um, is not actually allowing all the participants in, but they should be getting in within a few minutes. The majority of participants are actually called in, so they won't be able to vote. Um, so if you'd like, we can wait um, and set up this poll later on in the webinar so we can get more feedback, but that's, that's up to you. But within a few minutes, everyone should be getting in. Sorry. How did our how did our two who voted so far do, Leslie? <laughs> okay, so the answer is it's the eviction case. So in a protection order case, a custody case, there are witness in a criminal case. It's really clear that you know those are the locations related to a domestic violence case where their the enforcement is not supposed to occur. So I think. Patricia, from here on in, we may skip the polls at this point because if people are mostly called in, I think it would make more sense. Okay. 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 Okay, and here is what you have been asking about. Um, a little bit more detail about the sensitive location certificate of compliance process. And this is all set out in the DHS instruction, which I see Leslie provided a link to. Um, so feel free to go and sort of get even more details. But basically the process that requires the certification is set out in INA section 239E. And it requires that the locations I already mentioned a few slides ago have a certificate of compliance if any part of the enforcement action leading to the removal process or proceeding relied upon either abuser-provided information 
or was taken at a prohibited location. And the way we sort of created the certification process uh, back in 2013 when we created the policy, uh, we provide that before issuing a certification certification of compliance on the NTA, so on something called the notice to appear, we actually say, I certify that all the provisions have been followed. We actually require on another form, a form I-213, not really important, but we require the following information, that the sensitive location, um, we require where the sensitive location at which the enforcement action was taken, whether the information related to the alien's admissibility or deportability was supplied by a prohibited source, whether or to what extent such information was independently verified, which gets back to our not relying solely on a prohibited source, and an acknowledgement of compliance with the non-disclosure requirements, basically saying we haven't disclosed improperly to anyone. Once an officer or agent has reviewed this information, and it appears that the provisions and policies were followed, then they can certify on the NTA that the provisions of VAWA were complied with and could if, uh, still carry out an enforcement action. Um, and again, there, there's even more detail on our instruction that I won't get into right now. Okay, lastly, as I mentioned earlier, DHS must independently corroborate information provided by a prohibitive source. And some examples of what corroboration could look like um, for an outstanding removal order is um, a, D a DHS employee might check our databases or the alien's file to see if, in fact, there is an outstanding removal order. And for criminal convictions, if we want to corroborate that tip, we might look to NCIC or other criminal history databases or get information from our local law enforcement partners um, or look to court records um, of criminal convictions or pleas. So I'll tell you my quick little war story about um, the enforcement at the courthouse issue and then I'll move on to discovery. Um, earlier this year, I guess it was maybe February or so of this year, um, it's not clear whether the, the uh, ICE agent got a tip or how the ICE agent knew that a particular person was going to be at the courthouse, uh, but in any event, ICE agent showed up wearing an ICE jacket, so it was pretty visible, and it sent fear and panic throughout the building. Now, the, the thing to remember is that this has happened a handful of times in the past, and there was not such uh, fear and trepidation around here at the courthouse, but in this instance, it was shortly after the announcement of the travel ban, uh, and there was a lot of discussion about the new administration's position on immigration, and so, uh, you know, it was, people were sort of heightened in their sensitivity to these issues. So in walks the ICE agent in a jacket, and um, whispers start to go around the building, and within minutes, the ICE agent is redirected to a different building because he came, he had first come into the civil building, but he was really looking for the criminal building. But the civil building had a CPS docket underway, and lawyers started calling and texting their clients not to come to the courthouse. And so it threw that docket into disarray within minutes. The ICE agent then goes next door to the criminal building, and someone is arrested who had been on a criminal docket that afternoon. Someone is arrested in one of the elevators in that building. And so there are these newspaper articles that talk about, hey, I thought we had, you know, a, a non-enforcement policy at the courthouse. What happened? And it was it, it just threw everybody into a tizzy. And so I, I appreciate the information that Amy and uh, Danielle have provided to us in this webinar to help us better understand when enforcement actions can occur, in what kinds of cases, uh, the fact that there is a, 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 a process set out in advance. All of those things are really really very helpful uh, to practitioners and to advocates. So thank you for that. Let's uh, switch gears now to talk about VAVA confidentiality and state court discovery. Um, we, I think, are going to skip the polls, uh, but if you'll just think to yourselves about whether or not you've seen discovery requests that you found, kind of you found yourself scratching your head, particularly for those that are judicial officers in our audience today. I have received a few that I thought, well, what on earth do they need this information for? And the answers have been kind of, um, frankly, weak in a lot of respects. 
uh, but some good tries in other respects. And so typically what will happen in a family law case is that I'll get a motion to compel someone answer discovery, and the, the perpetrator's lawyer will say they've objected to giving us any information about their uh, immigration status or uh, anything at all about what's in their immigration file, and we're entitled to know that. And, of course, the other side is jumping up and down saying, you know, it's confidential and they don't need to have it and so forth. Uh, and so I'm left asking the first question, which is usually, why is it relevant? What kind of case are you in front of me on, and why do you need this information? If it's a family law case where you're having a custody battle, uh, what, what is it relevant to? What issue that the court has to decide will this make a difference? To one way or the other. Um, if it's a criminal case, you, the judge, I think, is incumbent upon the judge to start with an inquiry first and foremost, which is, why is this information relevant? Why do you need it? And if they can't articulate a reason, um, then they don't, they're not entitled to that information. It's also helpful for judges and advocates to know that the information is protected under federal law. Uh, and, and People will try as they might to get around that with some very creative arguments. I think we have to be, it's incumbent upon us to be vigilant and careful about it so that we don't um, trample on someone's right to keep that information confidential. It'll come up in criminal cases, in family law run-of-the-mill custody cases, divorce cases, um, protection order cases. It, it comes up in all of those contexts, uh, and we've seen them here at the courthouse in a number of different kinds of cases. Amy? Thank you. All right. Oops. Oops sorry. Oops. There we go. The last vowel confidentiality prohibition that I need to say a little bit more about is the non-disclosure of information prohibition. And this is meant to protect information in a survivor's immigration case from getting into the wrong hands, you know, most likely the perpetrator or abuser. Uh, this non-disclosure requirement prohibits disclosing even the existence of a VAWA T or U visa application, uh, as well as any information contained in the file. So even confirming that um, someone has filed for these applications is considered a violation of the non-disclosure provision. Um, and we're really careful, the department, to warn against even doing that. Um, and it's also important to note that this prohibition applies to all persons, not just the perpetrator. So it's not just that you can't disclose to the perpetrator, you can't disclose to anyone. Um, and this prohibition is one of the most protective that we see in uh, immigration law, even more so than the regulations that protect asylum and refugee information. Um, it protects information, again, about even the existence of the case or any information in or about the case and any action that DHS may have taken on the case. And then just to drill down for a second, the following are all the cases that are protected by the non-disclosure prohibition. So once someone has filed one of these applications, um, the non-disclosure kicks in. And I'll just give you a second to scan those. Okay. And I mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are some exceptions to the non-disclosure provision. And one such exception where we can share information is to our law enforcement um, partners and national security officials, but solely for a legitimate law enforcement or national security purpose. So we can't just share it because we you know, think something's interesting. We have to actually have a a business purpose there, and in a manner that protects the confidentiality of such information. So even when we do share it, um, we still take steps to protect that information, particularly from getting shared beyond the person that we shared it with. Um, and that very becomes, brief. Oh, go ahead. May Amy, that becomes super important because it's that provision that essentially empowers the judges to make decisions to deny these because in a, in a criminal case or a civil case involving between a perpetrator and a victim family court case, there's no question, there's no anonymity there. So as soon as it's released to the defendant and his counsel, that's the harm that this whole, all these provisions were designed to protect against. 
and, and that's especially true now that we've entered into this amazing electronic age because with you know just the click of a button that information can now go out into the community in places that it ought never travel so it, it becomes more and more important to protect it from everyone back to you Amy okay um, just very briefly some of the other exceptions that we have um, are for benefit granting or public benefit purposes for congressional oversight and data collection and um, adult victims can actually waive confidentiality in which case it would no longer apply and then lastly the exception that probably is the most relevant to this audience is the judicial review exception and this applies to judicial review of a victim's VAWA confidentiality protected immigration case and the DHS instruction does um, speak to this exception a little bit and it counsels that even the release of information under this exception should be done in a manner that protects the confidentiality of such information and then it also goes on to say please note defense counsel in state cases may sometimes attempt to make the entire a file discoverable however the entire file is not discoverable in its entirety under this exception Leslie? Yeah, so um, what's important to understand here is, and these are uh, quotes from the regulations, that agencies reviewing this information, so if a government, if, if Judge Livingston receives this information, according to the Department of Homeland Security regulations, she's not supposed to then release it. So it might, there are, there, and what's important to understand is in this context, just like many other contexts, that immigration law is federal administrative law. And there are, there is a, the Chevron case, the Supreme Court case in Chevron about courts giving deference to the agency's interpretive policies and regulations apply to this VOA confidentiality context too, just like it does to U visas, special immigrant juvenile status and the like. So this is kind of a tricky thing for judges, and let me just sort of tell you the quandary that it presents in some respects. I'm not supposed to share the information, and yet I am, in my role as a neutral arbiter, not supposed to have secrets either. So what do I do with information that I'm not supposed to share with anybody else? That's an uncomfortable position for a court to be in, and, and so I don't tend to want to have access to information that I can't share with both sides. So you right. can see We're how sure. this creates some real problems for judicial officers. Right. So what, what this means is, is it's more more reason to, if you have protective orders, uh, Judge Livingston, if you have protective orders in the case, if you actually rule on motions without actually seeing any underlying, you know, files to review and things like that, it avoids that problem, correct? That's correct. Okay. Exactly right. Danielle? Okay. Oh. Or Amy, I'm not sure who this is. Um, I, I think I'll do this slide and then kick it over to Danielle. So the statute provides that in the event of a violation, um, disciplinary action and or a $5,000 fine against the individual may be levied. Um, such violations also include making a false certification on the NTA, that process that um, I talked about earlier. And the department does have guidance on where alleged violations can be filed, and that's with my office, CRCL, and that is the work that my colleague, Danielle, does and um, is going to tell you more about. And I'll take the next slide first, and that is to also say that if you look at the legislative history of our confidentiality, um, Congress, the bipartisan legislative history written by Sensenbrenner and Conyers in 2005, also essentially empowers immigration judges in cases filed when VAWA confidentiality violations have occurred to dismiss the immigration proceedings. Perfect. Thanks so much, Leslie. So um, as Amy previously highlighted what VAWA confidentiality violations are and the penalties associated with them, I'd like to just take a minute to walk you through um, if violations do occur by DHS personnel, so that could be a general employee, an officer, or an agent with, with ICE, with USCIS, or with Customs and Border Protection, um, better known as CBP, we would encourage you to file a complaint with the DHS Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And so, as previously mentioned, both Amy and I work for this office. 
And so our office primarily aims to ensure that civil rights and civil liberties of individuals are not violated by efforts, activities, and programs aimed at securing the homeland. And so I specifically sit within the um, CRCL compliance branch, and our branch is charged with investigating complaints from the public alleging violations of civil rights and civil liberties. And so really quickly, I wanted to walk through just some examples of allegations that we investigate. So first, the failure to provide language accommodations to a hearing impaired individual. That would be an allegation that we would investigate. Um, improper seizure or warrantless searches. That would be an allegation. Use of excessive force during DHS apprehension, DHS processing, or DHS while you're in custody. And then inferior conditions of detention. So that could be a lack of appropriate medical care, medical privacy violations, or inappropriate grievance procedures. And then last but not least, violations of um, VAWA confidentiality requirements, which of course the presentation today is centered around. So it's important to note that when you do file a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, that we are not a disciplinary body. So we are essentially a policy-based branch, and we identify gaps in departmental-wide policy. And then based off of those gaps, we recommend policy enhancements to agencies, so USCIS to ICE, and then also to CBP. Um, once we do decide whether or not we're going to open a complaint, if we do open a complaint, we are going to go down one of three routes. Um, a complaint can either be open, one, as a retained complaint. So that complaint specifies allegations that are particularly egregious and would involve our staff going on site to investigate. Generally, in these instances, we bring outside experts with us to investigate these types of complaints. Um, and some examples of those types of um, particularly egregious complaints are attempted suicide and then a potential death, um, maybe at an ICE or CBP facility. Um, the second um, type of complaint that we can open, it's considered a short form. So that type of complaint is investigated by our staff, but it does not involve us going on site. Um, and then the third and final is a referred complaint. So that complaint would be investigated by the DHS component that is named in the complaint. And they, they conduct the investigation independently and then share the information with our office. And so just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the investigation process and just skip to why it's important to file a complaint. So the number one reason for us in order for individuals to file complaints is deterrence. So although we're not a disciplinary body, we do know that our investigations into complaints deter bad actors or DHS employees from committing civil rights violations. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, that is the overall goal, to make sure that violations are not happening. So deterrence is our number one reason. Um, in addition, medical issues. So we have the ability to be a bit nimble and to quickly pursue complaints that don't abide by um, medical standards or DHS standards and address medical issues that are raised fairly quickly. Um, policy recommendations. Based off of all of our um, investigations, if we do identify a gap in policy, we're able to make policy recommendations to DHS agencies under us. And hopefully, those DHS agencies will concur with those policy enhancements and then implement them. Um, the fourth is training for DHS components. Um, we likely, more than, than not, will issue um, components to re-engage with staff in training, because nine times out of 10, there's a training issue that's happening and the reason why um, civil rights are being violated or instances are reoccurring. Um, and then five is our information layer. And that's essentially the database that we use to take in all of our complaints. Um, with this aggregated data, we're able to spot trends and systematic, excuse me, systemic issues that may be occurring across the department, and we're able to address them with departmental leadership. And then last um, but not least is our annual report. So the annual report is something that is mandated by Congress, and it's a public-facing document. So we produce this um, report at the end of every fiscal year, and essentially it gives a snapshot of the work that we've completed throughout the fiscal year. It identifies how many complaints that we've taken in, how many we've opened, and then it also specifies um, the issues in which we um, addressed or, or drafted recommendation memos or recommendations to policy to various DHS agencies. And just some helpful tips and resources in regards to filing a complaint. 
So it's helpful to include information that is specific to the DHS agency that's being implicated, so the DHS agency that may have violated vowel confidentiality um, provisions, um, the incident and the civil rights violation, your name, and contact information. It's also important to note that complaints can be completely anonymous, but if they are anonymous, making sure that the other components within the complaint is visible is very helpful. So that means if the complaint is anonymous, make sure to include the DHS agency that violated um, your civil rights, um, outline the incident, and then the civil rights violation. And then in addition to that, I just wanted to note that if your complaint is related to employee misconduct, CRCL does have the ability to refer your complaint to the DHS agency's disciplinary body. So for example, if we received a complaint that was more aligned with employee misconduct for an ICE employee, we could refer that complaint to the Office of Professional Responsibility, which is at the internal disciplinary body for, for ICE. Um, and then also, last but not least, in order to file a complaint, we encourage individuals to use our CRCL mailbox, and that is CRCL compliance at hq.dhs.gov. That's our email address. Or you can call 202-401-1474. That's really Thanks. helpful. Thank you so much. So one, other, one question, Danielle, um, I, I just want to clarify at least my understanding, this is Leslie, is that generally speaking, complaints can be filed by anyone. So if you are um, a court or an advocate or an attorney, or, or it doesn't have to be like the individual victim who files the complaint. And so it, it's a much easier process than, let's say, filing a court case where you have to appear in that respect. And I also think that the other, when, when Danielle was talking about doing it anonymously, what may happen is either way, however you do it, you want to give information about, you know, time, place, date, things happen, names of officers if you know them, case numbers, locations, because ultimately what you're doing is you're triggering an investigation that will enable CRCL to go in and learn more details. They can see a lot more about the case than we can because they can go in and see on the backside what the computer says about who got a call when and what happened. And it gives them an ability to identify, as Danielle was saying, what is the training issue that this illustrates, right? Or, Definitely. you know, in, back in 2013, um, and 14, all DHS officials were required to take an online training program on VAWA confidentiality. Did that person take it? Did they not? Did, uh, you know, what led to this? Did they go to the supervisor? Did they follow the procedures that um, Amy was talking about? And so there's a lot of benefit that can come for victims of just using this process um, to raise awareness of what's happening and, and what we've seen happen on these kinds of cases is that um, over when, when an issue gets raised, the, uh, the officers involved hear about it and begin potentially to change some of their behavior. Judge Livingston? Okay, so uh, we talked already a little bit earlier about confidentiality and discovery in the context of state courts, and uh, Leslie and I are going to talk a little bit more about some specific cases, but um, I just want to repeat what I said earlier about my first question uh, when this comes up. It has to do with relevancy. Why is it relevant? Why do you need it? And I think we have to be uh, willing to challenge the requester of information that might be confidential as to not only why they need it, but what they intend to do with it, how will it matter to the decision maker, uh, you know, what facts or circumstances is it going to be important for us to consider as a court. Um, and once, once you start with those threshold kinds of questions, oftentimes it's my experience that, that they stop pushing and stop asking because it's really hard for them uh, to do that. So you'll see it, though, in the context, we can move to the next slide, in, uh, motions in limine, protective orders, uh, objections to discovery. Um, you know, you'll get some motions to compel 
hearing scheduled because somebody won't want to give it up and, and then you can really get at some of these issues. But we'll see it, I see it a lot of times in motion and limine practice, especially in a jury trial in a family law case. I know that's a foreign concept for some of you, but in my jurisdiction we actually have jury trials in family cases and, and so this comes up a lot in the context of motions and limine. Uh, we see it also in protective orders. Um, I don't see it as much in protective orders. Uh, but one thing I would, I would point out to judicial officers is that your protective order is really an opportunity for you to be um, forward thinking and thoughtful about how to prevent abuse in this area. And so you can include, you know, injunction, injunctive type language uh, to enjoin folks from um, attempting to gain access to information that they're not otherwise entitled to. You can put things in your protective orders that um, make sure that the rights of immigrant victims are protected. Uh, in an appropriate case, you have the opportunity to uh, sanction a lawyer for bad behavior and for uh, trying to gain access or to use information that they've gained inappropriately in an inappropriate way. We see a lot of that. Sometimes they'll get the information and then they, instead of holding on to it, then they you know, spread it around, so to speak, and once that happens, that's really sanctionable conduct. Uh, so there are some tools in your, in your toolbox that you can use to, on the front end, prevent inappropriate disclosure and on the back end, sanction inappropriate behavior when the time is right. But I think given the time of day, we should probably move to those cases, Leslie? Sure. What do you think? Sounds good. You just want to start with Hawk? Yeah. So, okay, thank you. Um, so there have been a number of federal district court cases and other cases addressing VAWA confidentiality in both the context of family court cases involving VAWA self-petitioning cases, U visa cases, and in criminal cases. And so essentially what they've all said is uh, supports what Judge Livingston was just talking about, which is VAWA confidentiality protects the, all cases from the time they were filed forever unless they're denied on their merits, um, that the judicial exception does not apply. There's a judicial exception in the statute. It applies to immigration judges reviewing a victim's immigration case, not to civil, family, or criminal court proceedings. The perpetrator's Sixth Amendment right to compulsory process does not give him access to absolutely privileged information. Um, or, and, it, and, it, um, and the goal of VAWA, because the goal of VAWA confidentiality is to prohibit the disclosure of, it, of absolutely confidential materials. In another case, they talk about this, that although it may be relevant to credibility and impeachment, if you go through the relevance analysis and you think it might be relevant, you still have to think about whether or not it makes sense to given what VAWA confidentiality's protections are, understand that you are releasing information directly to a perpetrator that he couldn't get from the federal government. And so courts have not, basically elected not to do that, and this case is another in illustration. And in the Dimash case, the court went so far as to say that they see that as another way for the perpetrator trying to interfere with the victim's immigration case or the access to immigration relief. There was a civil case, um, EEOC versus Koch. This was an employment case, and in that case, it, was, it went to the federal circuit court, and the circuit court instructed the district court that if they were going to do any discovery in, of a, in a case involving U visa victims, that, that they had to consider in crafting or considering the discovery request how it may intimidate other people from coming to court um, how it might compromise law enforcement efforts to hold perpetrators accountable, and to the extent it was, it was allowable in a civil employment case with multiple victims, they, the court basically said you need to maintain a, an, an anonymity. And that's not possible in a, federal, in a family court case or a criminal court case. Um, and so although there is some potential discovery, it is somewhat limited, and in fact, in the Koch case, what happened is, is they limited it to redacted certifications. Um, in criminal court cases, only the U visa certification itself done by a police or prosecutor is discoverable. 
There have been a number of cases um, that, that, but that discovery would not apply to a VAWA self-petition or a TVs or another case where, the, where no certification has been done or required. Um, and the two criminal cases, as we end this talking about, have, have ruled that there's insufficient justification when the, once the defendant knows about the case or has the U visa certification form for release of any other information in the file, um, the, the court found that they have adequate opportunity to cross-examine and call into question the victim's credibility without this discovery and that the courts, criminal courts should give a high level of protection to these immigration documents that are in these vital confidentiality protected cases. And in the Alvarez case, the court essentially found that it was a tangential collateral issue, speculation irrelevant to the case, and that the trial court was well within its discretion to exclude any not only the file, but any reference to the U visa or what might have happened with a U visa in the criminal proceeding. Um, any last words, Danielle or Amy or Judge Livingston, as we conclude, move towards the conclusion of the webinar? Nothing for me. I, I would just say this. It's a, it's a lot of information, I know, but the, the, the materials that Leslie has provided and the links that she's provided to the toolkits and to their technical assistance uh, library and, and other materials are really very helpful. And when you have time to sort of sit down and go through them, I think they'll be beneficial to you. She's available, of course, for technical assistance. Um, and so I know it seems daunting, but as you work your way through a particular case, I think you'll find these materials helpful in the end. And thanks for your participation. Great. And I'm posting again the link to the materials for today. It will have all the materials that we've referenced. It will have the, uh, for now, it'll have the PowerPoint, the, uh, actually a more detailed PowerPoint than we use today. Um, and it has the bios of all the presenters. Um, we have a web library with much more information. If you need it or like it, you can always call us for technical assistance. Um, and we're available to help. And we do do lots of technical assistance on vowel confidentiality violations. Um, <clears throat> and we encourage you, if you have a case that you think there has been a violation, please do call our helpline. We usually respond to those within 24 hours um, because most of these cases are quite urgent. Um, so thank you for your participation today. Um, if you have questions, please call us. Um, Patricia is going to be sending you from NCJ, FCJ, an evaluation. And again, I want to apologize for the technology glitch that kept some of you out of the webinar early, uh, earlier. Um, all of it will be recorded and online, and we are available to answer questions. So please do not hesitate to get questions to us. Um, and good, uh, good luck out there working with immigrant victims. We encourage you, you know, to call us with any questions you have regarding that. And thank you, uh, Patricia, for hosting this. Maybe you can keep it, uh, the webinar open just for a few minutes while people continue typing in case there's any last um, questions that we could answer um, or just to see what they're typing. Thank you very much. <laughs>